it's the end times, and we're all locked down in some form all over the world. If you're anything like me, you've binge watched The Office during this last year and a half at some point, if not more than once. Michael Scott is absolutely the best part of The Office, and since he's left our TVs, the best part of The Office left with him. Try to watch The Office without him, and it's not easy to enjoy it. It's actually so hard. That's what she said! <laughs> Michael! Michael! <laughs> Michael, on. please. Well, I've got you covered. Hi, I'm Mahmood. I'm a self-driving car engineer, and I just spent the last three months working on a video essay about Elon Musk, and I felt like I needed a change of pace. I wanted to take a break from autonomous vehicles and focus on a fun project. So I felt the best use of my time and all the skills I got during grad school where I got my PhD and years of experience doing research and development work was to take all of that and make a website which can detect that's what she said sentences. And it's fully working, even if it took a little effort to get it up. In fact, if you go to michaelscott.lol or that's what she said.lol, I couldn't decide so I just got both, you can try this out for yourselves. But how did we get here? How did we go from words spoken into a microphone all the way to having Michael come all over the screen? It covers a fair amount of statistical techniques used in natural language processing and some machine learning as well. And I want to tell you all about it. Well, what better opportunity to explain everything than during 3 Blue 1 Brown Summer of Math Explanation Competition? That's right, MathTubers, the engineers are here, so get ready for some actual practical applications. I know you're not used to it, but you can probably take it all in. This project was the first time I've ever done any form of NLP, and it wasn't without its challenges, but we got there. So let's break it all down and take a look at our Great Scott Pipeline. At one end, we have a sentence, and at the other, we have an output of either that's what she said or that's not what she said, depending on the input sentence. So in the middle here, we can probably apply some form of machine learning to figure out whether something is a that's what she said sentence or not. But you can't just input words into a machine learning algorithm and have it spit out a result. We have to somehow turn these words into numbers. In machine learning lingo, these are called features. A feature for a sentence can be almost anything, from how many words are in the sentence to the proportion of words that start with the letter B, anything you can think of. But what are the features we should be looking at? What features would best describe whether something is a that's what she said sentence or not? Well, lucky for me, I didn't need to figure it out because during my literature review, I came across a 2011 paper called That's What She Said, Double Entendre Identification by Chloe Kitten and Professor Yuri Brun. And this is probably some of the most fun I've ever had reading a paper. If you're a fan of the middle out scene from Silicon Valley, this paper is the equivalent of that, where it painstakingly breaks down what technically makes a sentence a that's what she said sentence. So let's break down that's what she said. If you think of all the sentences that can ever be as falling into a category of either erotic or non-erotic contexts, a non-erotic context would be something said during a business meeting or at church. An erotic context would be, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. If we draw out a Venn diagram of all sentences and where they lie between a non-erotic and erotic context, the overlap in the middle would be where all the that what she said sentences live. It's a sentence that can exist both in an erotic and non-erotic context. That's a double entendre. I like the double her entendre. <laughs> Please. Wrong show, but I couldn't resist. So to start on this journey of teaching the computer what smut is, we need to give an example of downright, absolutely, no questions about it, everyone can agree about it, filth. We do this by first defining a list of sexual nouns. Nouns for those who need a refresher are naming words, things. I used the list described in the paper and added a few of my own words on there. I'm not showing the list here, but there are 68 words, the cleanest of which is probably but. You can use your imagination to fill out the rest. We also define a list of body parts. And these are our first two features. Presence of a sexual noun and presence of a body part, one or zero for both. But now, things get a bit trickier. We need to teach the computer the difference between the erotic and the non-erotic domain. For that, we need examples of both. 
The non-erotic domain is easy. There's something called the brown corpus, which apart from being the two unsexiest words put next to each other, is a collection of American English published in the 1960s. It's all prim and proper and has language from multiple fields, from editorial press to religion and humor. So it should have our bases covered. For the erotic corpus, we need to go somewhere a little more icky. There's a website, textfiles.com, which catalogues text files that were around between 1980 to 1995. These were usually uploaded to bulletin boards, which can be thought of as the social media of the 80s and 90s. Textfiles.com have very helpfully categorized the different text files. One of the categories is the erotica section. These are erotic stories that were uploaded usually by men who were super into computers and didn't really do anything outside of computers while it's, it's porn they're porn and it, it's not even good it's like lowest common denominator icky not written by a professional writer or someone who's even had any erotic experiences these stories make mills and boone seem like shakespeare and for us they're perfect next up we need three different functions and no joke this is the actual names in the paper noun sexiness adjective sexiness and verb sexiness the easiest of these is adjective sexiness these are describing words the adjective sexiness is the proportion of sentences containing that adjective which also contains sexual nouns from our erotic corpus so if a sentence contains the words big butt the word big would be counted as the adjective since but has previously been defined as a sexual noun. So I processed all the adjectives in the erotic corpus for the adjective sexiness score and I've got the list over here. The top ones are... Men are disgusting. I could just read the list but my soul doesn't want that. So I've called in my friend Janet and she's going to help us go through it. <laughs> Welcome to Family Feud. Uh, this is my friend Janet here. And today uh, we are going through, the question is, um, what are the eight most frequent adjectives in user-submitted erotic stories? Janet, there are eight adjectives up here on the board. You've got three chances uh, before you strike out. Busty. Is it on the board? Oh. Sorry. Uh, busty is not on the board, Janet. Oh. The the issue here, I think, is that you are you are still thinking like up here. You need to like bring it, bring it all the way down. Um, let's go with one of the world's most you know society's favorite words. Let's try moist. Uh, moist, good guess. Let's see where that is on the board. Is moist up on the board? Oh, I'm not. sorry, Janet. Uh, okay. Final answer, I'm drunk out of my mind. I've got nothing else to do. People will think that they're publishers. Let's go with the word hot. All right, let's see. Is hot up there on the board? Hot, final answer. Oh, yes! Yay! You got it. <laughs> well done, Janet. It is the fifth most common one, appearing in 2.1% of all sentences. Yeah, okay. So that's almost about one, one use of the word hot per chapter. We assume a chapter is about a hundred sentences or maybe there's like one dude who's like just <laughs> filling it out with it like every... let's try wet sticking in that weather realm let's check if wet is up there on the board <laughs> yes wet is the second most commonly used adjective let's go for the reveal okay all right we're ready how disgusting right. are men eighth most popular word <laughs> open 1.6 percent <laughs> white wow that is triggering okay <laughs> Number six, big, deep, number ah, four. See, yeah. cavernous came across my head, but that wouldn't have been a word at all. Uh, next one, you're going to kick yourself for not getting this one. Oh, am I? Is it Asian? Hard. Hard. What on a woman is that? Hey. Hold on. Hold on. I'm ready. So count down. Three, two, one. Little appears in almost 6% of all sentences wow. with sexual nouns. About... This is really interesting as an Asian woman as well, because as you can understand, we're a group of people that are quite often sexually fetishized. And mm -hmm. I recently learned 
in a forum of other Asian women, um, nonetheless, <laughs> that I have grown up oblivious to this idea that there is a stereotype that Asian women in particular are more subservient and more submissive and, you know, better at that serving thing. And I just, it never occurred to me because I have never thought of myself <laughs> as being subservient or there to be as of service for other people. And um, No, that's, and so those just, are not words I'd use to describe you. No. And so this, this idea that you've just sent to me is, again, something that I just pff, doesn't even register. Now we move on to verb sexiness. For this one, we use this trusty Bayes theorem. The main question we're trying to answer with this measure is how likely is this particular verb to appear in an erotic context versus a non-erotic context? And for this, Bayes' theorem is the absolute best way to do it. It sounds complicated and mathy, but stick with me, we got this. This formula can be rewritten in this way. But let's take a leaf out of 3B1B's book and go visual with this. Here's a box showing all the sentences we have. We can split this box into two boxes. One is the brown corpus and the other is the erotic corpus. We can see one is slightly bigger than the other, so we need to scale down the erotic corpus so they're proportionally similar. If we don't do this, then the size of the bigger corpus will start to bias the results towards it, and we don't want our verbs getting too sexy. This first part of the numerator is asking for the probability of a verb showing up in a sentence with a scope of only looking at the sentences in the erotic domain. This is pretty much exactly what our adjective sexiness measure was, but it's for verbs. Next, we multiply it by the probability of a sentence belonging to the erotic domain, which, because we've scaled it, is 50%. But it ends up giving us this area. We then divide that by the probability that a verb shows up in all sentences across all domains. Put simply, we're saying out of all appearances of sentences containing that verb, what proportion of those sentences were from an erotic context. That ends up giving us the list of verb sexiness. You can 100% without a doubt guess the top few entries in this. Some notable mentions are lubricate, drench, and impale. <sighs> On the other end of the scale, the least sexiest words are words like specify, consult, value, clarify, attribute, publish, basically everything that you do during grad school. Well, the algorithm checks out. We have verb sexiness down. We're now on to the noun sexiness. This is the biggest contribution of this paper in my opinion because with it, they found a way to identify euphemisms. The reason for this is that very rarely you'll find a that's what she said sentence with an actual sexual noun in it, because that would end up placing it firmly in the erotic domain. We need to be able to find nouns that have multiple meanings, but can also be used in ways very similar to sexual nouns. Examples of these would be rod, meat, buns, cake, words which can be used in everyday language, but also you know. The way we do this is by identifying if these words are used in a similar way to sexual nouns. How do we do this? First, we create a matrix with a height of all the nouns that appear and all the corpora we have access to. Yes, this is a very long list. And a width of all the adjectives that appear in our corpora. Yes, also a very long list. We end up with this one big mega matrix that links adjectives to nouns. We then go through every sentence and count the number of adjectives which modify each noun until we've populated our list with counts for all adjectives and all nouns. Comparing two separate rows of nouns to each other at this stage is a waste of time, since the frequency of how often these nouns appear will make them seem very different from one another. We need to instead use an algorithm called TF-IDF, which stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency, which is a terrible name. <laughs> the term frequency for a specific adjective of a specific noun in our case is the number of appearances of the adjective for that noun, divided by the total number of appearances of all adjectives for that noun. This normalizes our vector since the value of all the adjectives for that specific noun will now add up to 1. But we can't stop there. There will be adjectives that appear which are extremely versatile. That means that these will be less useful to help identify the hidden meaning. An adjective like little is quite versatile and wouldn't be as useful to help narrow down which euphemism it's applied to as for example the word hard. I can't believe I'm making this video. 
this is where document frequency comes in. Document frequency is literally the number of nouns which have the term appear in them. If we divide the document frequency by the total number of nouns, we get the proportion of documents which contain that letter. If we inverse this term, we get the inverse document frequency, which is a term that will be equal to 1 if the adjective appears for all nouns, while it begins to approach infinity if the adjective only ever modifies a single noun. This is now a term which lets us see how important or unique a particular adjective is across all nouns, so that we can pay more attention to the adjectives which stand out the most. To get the TFIDF, we simply just multiply the term frequency by the inverse document frequency, and that gives us a normalized then weighted by importance term frequency for each adjective for each noun. Oh, and before I forget, we also slap on a log function so that we can scale the numbers approaching infinity. We don't need to get that far. I'd go into it further, but I'm sure you can handle a log by yourselves. We're now ready to compare. We can do this by representing each noun as a vector appearing in adjective dimensions. This is a multi-dimensional problem, or a multi-multi-multi-dimensional, there are so many dimensions we need to look at all at the same time. To simplify, let's look at a case with two adjectives and extrapolate from there. Say we have two nouns with a specific TFIDF for two adjectives. In comes a third noun with this vector. If you look at the distances between the vectors, it would appear that it's spatially closer to noun 1. However, the vector is much more similar to noun 2, except a bit shorter. This means that focusing on finding the shortest Euclidean distance, i.e. the minimum distance between the arrowheads, is not the right measure. It's the angle or direction of this adjective vector that we need to pay attention to. We then take the cosine of this result. If we receive a value close to 1, that means these nouns are modified by the adjective that matter in similar ways. If we get a value close to 0, we can tell that they're not similar at all. We simply do this for all nouns and take the maximum cosine similarity found for comparison to our set of sexual nouns, and that is our noun sexiness. That was a long one. But now that we have our adjective, verb, and noun sexiness functions, I can't believe this video is real. We finally have our feature set for every sentence. We can now pre-process a sentence by taking in the words and extracting these features from the sentence, which then become a vector which represents about 16 different features of that sentence. We now get to do machine learning. For the machine learning, we need two things. First, we need some examples of things that are that's what she said sentences and things that are not. This is tricky because we need thousands of these examples, and if I sit here all day coming up with examples, they're only going to represent the things that I think about rather than a more generalized version. Plus, it'd take a really long time, and I don't want to do that. I managed to get in touch with Professor Yuri Brun, who is now a professor at the University of Massachusetts, and he sent me the data sets that him and Chloe used in the development of their algorithm. This saved me a ton of work, and without it, it wouldn't have been possible to do. I don't want to just leave it there though. I wanted to let you guys have a play around with this because it's really cool and really fun. So I called in a favor from my friend Tabs, who is a front-end developer and live coding streamer, and just a cool person in general, totally worthy of your follow. Links in the description. And she, using an extremely poor sense of judgment, agreed to helping me set up a website which can talk to my code. So this is what the app looks like. It's called Michael Scott Companion, so you can always carry him around with you. Very simply, you just click listen, and it should start listening and listing out the words that you're speaking. And then if you say a that's what she said sentence, it should trigger that and Michael Scott will come out. That was so hard. That's what she said. <laughs> Please. I want to put that in my mouth. That's what she said. Or he said. The sensitivity slider is really important. If you put it all the way up to plus, it will think everything is a that's what she said joke. And if you put it all the way minus, it might miss some things that are very obviously that's what she said jokes. This is what we call false positives and false negatives. It's generally better to tolerate false negatives in this. 
um rather than false positives because it's the worst thing is like when michael scott like interjects with something that's obviously not a that's what gz sentence you can play around with the sensitivity to a point that gets you the most pleasure and here we are we can now go to that's what she said dot lol or michael scott dot lol and have a great time it's still got some kinks and it doesn't always work but you're free to go there and give it a try you have to be using safari if you're on ios or chrome if you're on anything else we'll be updating this website over the next few weeks to make it run smoother and tabs even said that she might be putting in a streamer mode which will allow you to run this in obs while you stream but you'll have to bug her on twitter about it there are of course some improvements we can make the main one i think would be to look at homophones these would be words that sound identical but are spelled differently or as i like to call it the cum conjecture these are very obvious targets for that's what she said sentences but because the algorithm is trained on written as opposed to spoken language it misses that nuance but all of that is for someone else if you'd like to help develop this further a link to my discord is in the description below or just reach out on twitter if you want to see the dirty word lists i'll make them available in a channel on the discord too i don't want to put normal people through this Special shout out to Tabs for making the front end not look horrible and thanks to Professor Yuri Brun for sending me the starter. Couldn't have done it without you. Chloe, if you see this, please ignore my frantic messages. So there we go. I taught a computer what smut was and released an app for it publicly. I'm now going to go have a shower and seriously think about my life choices. Autonomous vehicle videos coming back again soon, as soon as I can find the effort to get them up.